scripture reading this afternoon is Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. The text of this afternoon's sermon as after is the 14th verse of this chapter. Hebrews 9. Then verily, the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and the worldly sanctuary. And there was a tabernacle made, the first, wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold. Wherein was the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the covenant. And over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat, which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Then to the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. But the blood of bulls and of goats, the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, and by means of death, the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For a testament is, it must also of necessity be the death of the testator. The testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, either the first testament was dedicated without blood, or when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats, of water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God has sprinkled which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others, and then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Now, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. 
as it is appointed unto men once to die, therefore this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So far we read God's holy word. The text of this afternoon's sermon is applicatory is the 14th verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offer himself without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? After the administration of the Lord's Supper, Reformed churches saw fit to have a sermon that is called Applicatory. There is a question asked of every consistory when the church visitors come to visit the consistory. Is the administration of the Lord's Supper have with it a preparatory sermon preceding a sermon in connection with the Lord's Supper preached concerning the sacrament and following an applicatory sermon. A distinct kind or type of sermon that is known as applicatory to be preached after the Lord's Supper. What is the nature of that sermon? What is it that makes an applicatory sermon an applicatory sermon? The word itself, applicatory, from the word application, answers that question. Application signifies strength, it signifies joy, it signifies energy, it signifies specifically the work of God, that we saw as the power of salvation. And now the matter of application is this, in what channel, in what pathway, specifically and concretely, does that power run? How does that power show itself? How does it manifest itself? We see this very clearly with respect to the significance of the Lord's Supper itself. What did you eat? What did you drink? Not what you ate and drank with your physical mouth. Not what you received into your physical bodies by means of eating and drinking bread and wine. But what did you spiritually partake of? You ate spiritually by faith the body of Christ. You drank spiritually by faith the blood of Jesus Christ. What that means is that you, by God's grace, are partaker of the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ. You are partaker of the grace of God in Jesus Christ, that wondrous spiritual power of all your salvation from beginning to end. Now the question becomes then, what is the direction of that grace? What does that grace produce? What does that grace cause with all of its power and all of its glory? Now you must not understand this direction in this matter of a sermon that is called applicatory, that somehow grace is an untamed, uh, wild, animal that is capable of causing harm and damage and it needs uh, a corral or it needs training or it needs uh, reining in some kind of restraining force to keep it from causing damage and so applicatory is all about containing grace it's just the opposite it is to show the power of the grace of God working in us as the fruit and effect of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross 
in our life's way, in our journey. What does sanctification mean? It's great work of God in Jesus Christ according to its proper fruit and its proper effects in your and my life. And that is the very heart of this word of God in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. The power of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to purge your conscience from dead works and to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That is the direction. That is the power of God's grace in Jesus Christ. So here we have in this text two sources of gratitude given to us. And both those sources of gratitude signify powerfully in the Lord's Supper. That is, Jesus Christ is demonstrated to us in the Lord's Supper as the fulfillment of the law. The law cannot condemn us. The law cannot destroy us. The law never again requires of us that which we cannot perform to destroy us or to condemn us. It is fulfilled in Jesus Christ himself. We are free from condemnation. Secondly, the source of gratitude from the Lord's Supper for us is to know, to be assured of the cleansing and the purging power of his blood to give us life out of death. His blood is indeed, his blood is truly our deliverance, truly our salvation. So we see here in Hebrews 9 verse 14 in particular, how the sacrifice of Christ is very powerfully directed to true obedience. And I must say, this is what captured my attention to use this text for applicatory. We have one of the most outstanding, powerful words concerning our salvation in this text. To purge your conscience from dead works. From dead works. And that purging of our conscience from dead works seen as necessary to true, real, genuine obedience. How to serve this living God. We need our conscience purged from dead works. Works that we might suppose our service to God but in truth are not because they are simply dead. To serve in the freedom of the Spirit and in the liberty of the children of God. Such is the gift, the blessed, glorious gift of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross to us. So we consider then this word of Hebrews 9 verse 14 under the theme, the purging blood of Christ. The purging blood of Christ. We note, first of all, the glorious comparison. Second, the holy separation. And then thirdly, the blessed reason. The glorious comparison first, then the holy separation. And thirdly, the blessed reason. We can arrange this first point to answer a very simple question. And that question is, where? Where? The comparison that is made between the law of the Old Testament and the gospel of the New Testament deals with the matter of place. This place as carefully and thoroughly laid out in the first part of Hebrews chapter 9. We want to understand that this place is significant in two respects. First of all, its place is something of a, a, a middle kind of area. A middle kind of area. This is the area of the tabernacle. 
we might extend this truth about the tabernacle to the holiness of the place where dwelled the children of Israel. So by virtue of the tabernacle, God's dwelling place, God's tent among the tents of the children of Israel, that camp of God's people was a holy place distinguished from all other places in the whole earth. The whole earth is characterized by darkness. The whole earth is characterized by the corruption of sin. But then there is the space occupied by God's holy, peculiar people. And that holiness has really controlled in its uh, place and system of the Old Testament law by the tabernacle and everything that went on about the tabernacle. So you might say, here is this holy place upon the earth, a holier place, the place of the tabernacle, and the most holy place in all the earth was what is called in Hebrews 9 here, the second tent, the second tabernacle, the most holy place where was the Ark of the Covenant, the censer, and so on, into which the high priest went only once a year. Now the reason I say that the holy place with the tabernacle at its center will occupy the middle place was because, must understand, what Hebrews tells us is that it is not heaven. It is not heaven. It is under heaven. It's meant to represent heaven in a significant way. But the important point made by Hebrews 9, that it is not heaven. It is of the law. It is of, it is the shadow of things to come and is not itself that which is to come. Now the reason I talk about this distinct and this particular place defined so carefully in Hebrews chapter 9 is because this was the entire realm in which the Old Testament priesthood dealt. Everything the high priest did, everything that the priesthood did, only dealt with this holy place, this holy area upon the earth, as signified, as in its own way teaching something about heaven, but clearly not heaven itself. Now, the high priest is shown here in Hebrews 9 to be a traveler. He is a mover. He goes. We might say this is a very short journey, but it is nevertheless for all that a journey. This priest begins outside the tabernacle. He begins outside the first tabernacle. The priest had a certain way, the priest had a certain manner to approach into that first tabernacle. You think of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6. When these things were thus ordained, ordained by Moses, ordained according to the law, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. They had their things to do, they had their routine to follow, they had their actions to perform, and because they had done these things, they had this access into the first tabernacle, so that the people watching might say, well, there that priest goes, bearing us upon himself into God's fellowship, but only so far. Only so far, and no further. Reaching upon earth this limit. He could go no further. But now that law gave one exception. One exception, giving that priest the right, the duty, to go, well, just a little bit further. Verse 7, into the second went the high priest alone once every year. And his manner of entrance into that place still required a work, still required activity on his part as that priest. This is what he had to do 
And to the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. Now we come back to the point of this tabernacle, this temple being this middle place in the earth. Now, like you said, there goes that priest. He passed through the first tabernacle. He continued on into the second tabernacle. Into God's true presence? Into heaven itself? No. Know what follows in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, the Holy Ghost, not just man, but the Holy Ghost through that word that's carried out by the priesthood, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. He was blocked out. He was shut out. Even though he went into that second tabernacle, that specific time, once a year, that truth, the truth of that most holy place, there was no entrance there. There was a barrier. It was not yet the time. Keep in mind that this is the law. This is the law of the Old Testament. The law of the Old Testament, the Word of God given by the Holy Spirit, signifying many things, but among all the things signified is this, that for all that movement, all that entrance, the true way into the true holiest, holiest was not yet open. He was still excluded. He was still shut out. As long as the first tabernacle was yet open. Standing. The entire character of the Old Testament law was, yes, there is a way. There is a way. But not yet. There is a way. But not yet because of something that characterized all these priests. Something that characterized all the offerings of all these priests that they made. No priest was worthy. No offering was worthy, though they were offered according to the law. Because they all had to serve a once-for-all sacrifice made by the true high priest, Jesus Christ himself. Now, the emphasis that is made on the particular approach that is made beginning at verse 11. The contrast starts there, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Not of this building, but of his body. The body, the sign of which you partook of this morning in the Lord's Supper. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. His blood, the sign of which you drank in the Lord's Supper this morning, was the glory of his sacrifice alone to give this entrance for himself into the holy place, according to verse 12. The holy place not made with hands. The holy place of God himself, of which the holy place upon the earth, the tabernacle, was only a shadow. So dim and still upon this earth. Christ entered into heaven. The contrast that is so sharp is this. Verses 13 in contrast to verse 14. If the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. There is a comparison we have our eye exactly 
on. The flesh of that priest, his earthly body supposed to move into the first tabernacle, then into the second tabernacle. Through the veil, that flesh had to be purified by these sacrifices and rites to be able to do that. Now, the contrast is this. If this meager, earthy way that was merely physical was true that this blood was required, verse 14 carries the weight, how much more shall the blood of Christ? His own blood. Not merely the blood of a man who is high priest, but the blood of him who is the very Son of God himself. The blood of the Lamb, the blood of the perfect, holy, high priest, the Son of God, how much more shall that blood of Christ? You understand the point that is made in verse 14 here. That blood was the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. The most striking difference. And the glorious comparison is this. There was no movement at all of Christ. As those priests from one place on the earth to another place on the earth, from one place that was less holy to another place that was more holy. The eternal blood of Christ that he offered was his offering unto God in heaven, before God in heaven, giving to him the right to enter into heaven itself as our high priest. Not merely for himself, but for us in whose stead he died. And to know that as you partook of the Lord's Supper this morning, as you by faith partook of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, his place into which he has entered by his own blood is your place. His direction to the eternal God is your direction. All through, all by, all in his precious blood. You are partakers of Christ in his entrance into glory. The powerful word of God before us in this 14th verse also indicates a particular deliverance. And this particular deliverance that is spelled out in verse 14 shows to you and me how it is that we offer ourselves a living sacrifice to God in and through his mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 9 verse 14 does so in a very powerful way. We are meant exactly to apply the beginning word of this verse to this deliverance that is shown us in here in verse 14. How much more? That how much more is meant to apply not merely to Christ in his offering himself to God as a sacrifice in his own blood, is meant also to apply to you and me in the power of his blood. How much more for you and for me? Now that power is given in this word of God a very distinct, a very powerful form. It is a power to purge. Now that word purge is itself a very powerful word. It speaks of cleansing, and it speaks of a removal. We can speak of this removal as, very simply, a removal of what is harmful, a removal of what defiles, a removal of what corrupts. You have something in you that is detrimental to you. You have something in you that is harmful to you. 
Now you can think of that thing within you as harmful because it represents a weakness, it represents an infirmity. There is that which you would like to do, there's that which you would want to do, but you find you cannot because there's this thing inside of you that prevents you and hinders you always. Similarly, you can think of that which is evil inside of you, that which is a hindrance inside of you, that hinders you in fellowship and in a relationship. You want to enjoy, you want to have a full, free relationship, face-to-face, heart-to-heart, being able to speak and hear uh, freely without any sense of shame, without any sense of fear, but there is this thing inside of you that keeps that from happening. It is a hindrance, it is a barrier. And so the question might be asked, what do you need to have gone? What do you need to have removed from you? Say, well, I find in myself a great evil. I find in myself a great hindrance. And of that evil, of that hindrance, I need to be purged. I need some outward action applied to me, that which I find not within myself, and that to have such a power and such a strength that after it is done, I can say, I am cleansed. I am clean. That thing that hindered me, that thing that prevented me is now gone. Purging. Now the particular point of this purging is our conscience. Our consciences are presented as being in need of this purging, in need of this cleansing. When we think of our conscience, we're meant, according to the Word of God, to have a certain and distinct knowledge about ourselves. Self-knowledge Self-understanding, who are you, who am I? Now that knowledge of ourselves, according to this word conscience, means that we see and know ourselves in light of a certain standard outside of us. I think of the sermon as advocatory. We think of a standard outside of ourselves that we take and apply to ourselves. How do we measure up? How do we compare with this standard? And now here we think of our conscience in its most important respect. What is the true significance of your conscience? What is the true need of your conscience before God? It is to know that the standard of God's acceptance of you, you meet. The standard of God's acceptance of you, you meet. Understand that in the light of God's holiness, God's righteousness, and God's glory that is revealed in Scripture. So that, knowing God as he truly is in himself, that you must be able to say, In your conscience, I can stand before his presence. I can have fellowship and communion with him. My conscience tells me it is so. I, as I meant to know myself, I know that I can have this fellowship with God. I can stand before this God as he is. I can not to lower him. I'm not to change the standard of holiness and righteousness and glory to accommodate who I might be. I have to know that as he truly is, I can stand before him. Now think about your conscience. What you know about yourself. What you know about your ways, your heart, your lips, your hands, your feet. You must say that your conscience needs a great deal of purging. And now what does Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 say about what our consciences need to be purged from? 
Here's the most striking thing about this word of God. It doesn't say from sin. It doesn't say from uncleanness. It doesn't say from corruption. It uses only two words. To purge your conscience from dead works. From dead works. That word works refers to everything that the law of God requires. Works. That law that says, here is what you must be, here is what you must do to have acceptance with God. Therefore, produce, work, commit, act, keep all God's law, and keep it as required of you. Not provided, not given, but according to the truth about God's law, what God requires. He that doeth these things shall live in them. He that doeth these things shall live by them. As well as cursed be he that doeth that doeth not all the things which are written in the book of the law to do them. There's only one thing that occupies in you and me that category. What Hebrews 9 verse 14 calls dead works. We are told that those dead works are what interrupts and does not allow you and me fellowship with God. They need to be cleansed from our conscience. They need to be taken away. They need to be pushed out. And there is given to us here in this word of God only one remedy, only one power to so cleanse us, to so cleanse our conscience. The blood of Jesus Christ. We want to take note of the power of that blood. That blood is, first of all, the power of God's grace. To so wash your conscience of dead works. To cover it before God's sight. And before God's eyes. So with this holy eye, as he looks upon your conscience, he sees your conscience as washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So before God himself, your conscience is clear. That's not the real point here. The point is the application of that blood to you and me consciously, according to the truth of our conscience. That is to say, as you partook of the Lord's Supper this morning, as you ate the body of Jesus Christ by faith, as you drank his blood by faith, we're filled with the truth of the glory of that work. You're meant to be admonished. You're meant to be assured. That, sacri that once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the fullness of all your salvation. As washed in that blood, you're meant to take that work of Jesus Christ, fill your conscience with that work, and to have that work grow, increase, prosper, carry all its weight, all its glory, all its significance into your conscience to push out all your works. To show in contrast to that glorious living sacrifice of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself and his blood to God to say there's absolutely nothing, nothing that I have done, nothing I am doing. Nothing that I shall ever do that can even compare at all to the glorious sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. That sacrifice is everything. My works are nothing. They are dead. There is no refuge. There is no peace. There is no hope in them at all. 
I have one testimony to clear me before God. I have one testimony to make me acceptable before God. One testimony to make me worthy of his fellowship and friendship forevermore. Christ died for me. That testimony of God's word sealed in the Lord's Supper to us. Such is the power of the blood of Jesus Christ for us. No trouble, no sorrow, and no fear. This must be our strength then to have our full, confident approach to God. Fully. Not propping up ourselves on anything that we have done. Not diminishing God's glory, His holiness, or righteousness in the least. But being fully to know it all in and through the blood of Jesus Christ. To know the power of His blood to bring us to life. Having our, our conscience so purged is indeed our freedom. Our freedom to know nothing but Christ Jesus crucified and Christ Jesus crucified alone to bring us to the living God. This is the wonder of that blood of Jesus Christ as our high priest recorded here in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. As it belonged to Christ, our high priest, this is its power, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. We are meant to dwell on that sacrifice of Christ shedding his own blood in that wondrous glory. And that glory that was unto God in heaven. And to know that power of that blood within us it must be understood to be a remarkable thing that what is indicated in the Lord's Supper what is signified and sealed to you and me in the Lord's Supper is this. Partaking of the body and blood of Jesus Christ does not mean that we are somehow covered over with his body or covered over with his blood as we might say is signified in baptism according to the simple nature of the sacrament sprinkled on. You receive the signs of Jesus' broken body and shed blood into yourself. Into yourself. You eat. You drink. You receive into your bodies for your nourishment and for your strengthening. It is signified to you in your partaking of the Lord's Supper that Jesus Christ is your life. His blood is your life. His body is your life. His sacrifice is your life. You have no other life. You have no other strength. You have no other ability than Christ himself. In the language of the Heidelberg Catechism's teaching using Ephesians chapter 5, you are flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone. You are governed by the spirit of Jesus Christ as the spirit that lives in the head, that lives in you as members of the head, and you are governed by that spirit as the spirit of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 14 speaks of what you have by that blood that you partake of. Your conscience purged from dead works to serve the living God. That is the real point of the contrast. By dead works, you cannot serve the living God. Your works as dead are wholly antithetical, wholly the opposite of the living God. There's only one service of the living God. 
That is from God. From the living God himself. Sent into our realm of sin, death, destruction, corruption, and condemnation. God has sent his only begotten son. That only begotten son of God. This high priest offered himself through the eternal spirit unto God by his blood. It is that blood that is all your life to serve the living God. Your life as that life of Christ given in you to stand before the living God in his service. Redeemed by that blood, purchased by that blood, that blood as you have partaken of it to be your life, so in that life, you stand before God in gratitude for his salvation. You say to your God every day, how might I serve thee? How might I please thee? What is there for me to do that brings to thee glory, honor, and praise? It is your privilege and your blessedness in that life of Jesus Christ, not in yourself by any means, to hear from God. What is pleasing in his sight? What he calls you to do every day. To offer up yourself a living sacrifice of thanksgiving by that blood. In the power of that blood, to take up what he has given you to do. To serve him and to glorify him. To show your gratitude for all that he has done for you. Such as the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. His power redeem you to serve the living God to his glory and to his praise. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. Thank thee for the glorious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The power of that blood as thy gift to us. Give us true and living God our true and living God, to be our Redeemer by his blood. We thank you for the power of that blood to cleanse our consciences from dead works. We thank you for the power of that blood to turn us to the service of thee, the living God. Grant us grace through that precious blood to serve thee, to do what is pleasing in thy sight, to bring glory to thy name, to show our gratitude for all that thou hast done for us. So keep us and bless us under thy care. We thank thee for our time together in this week gone by. We thank thee for our fellowship. We pray that thou remember us as we part from one another. Watch over us. Keep us in thy hand. We thank thee that whatever parting we experience in this present life, that we are glad to know the promise of being brought together in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember us in thy, in thy great salvation. Hear us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We sing now Psalter number 236. 236. Psalm 86. Servant's prayer, we note the second stanza. Help me thy will to do, thy truth I will pursue, teach me to fear. Give me the single eye, thy name to glorify, the Lord my God most high, with heart sincere. We sing the four stanzas of 236.
Now the God of peace, that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, with the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank <laughs> you. 